Welcome, guys. Please be seated. I wanted to start by saying we're sommelier finance. We're not a wine company. That is one of the common things that people come up and ask, like, are you guys into? <laughs> That's our CEO right there. Uh, definitely not a wine company. We do love wine, uh, but we're not a wine company. And we're going to cover a little bit about why we should exist, what is the market need, and then we're going to cover a little bit about high-level architecture of what we are trying to bring to the DeFi ecosystem. And then Sun over here is going to actually dive deeper into the actual first strategy that we're bringing online. And it's going to be a little more technical. And then we're going to cover it up by, uh, in the end, a user interface that is launching in a couple of weeks. Right? So it's really exciting time for us. It's been uh, a lot of work uh, put in by a large team. And, uh, and it's coming to a good culmination. So we're excited. So all right. So, there are many different types of users on the on the DeFi side, but we're going to be focusing on the three main use cases, right? Like so, traditional finance. That's really blurred. That's that's really blurred. Can you guys read that? No. We'll have to take our word for it. All right. Oh. Sorry, did not plan on this. Uh, that's like it clearly says limited focus right there. <laughs> clearly. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk to it. I, I don't need the actual slide, so it's kind of fine. Uh, so there are three main users uh, of the DeFi ecosystem, right? Like main, main stakeholders, traditional finance. Obviously, we want them to kind of start getting into the DeFi ecosystem and their current challenge is uh, that they don't really have access to, they have machine learning models, they have built over many, many years, and they have risk managed, data driven models, but they have no direct infrastructure to actually target to DeFi markets. When we say DeFi markets, we're talking about Uniswap, uh, Aave, Compound, those kind of markets in general, right? Like, so there is no direct uh, pointing of the ecosystem or the, the machine learning models that they have built for many years uh, into the DeFi market. So that's one challenge. What SOM does is allows people, or SOM chain, uh, our architecture allows people to directly point uh, the machine learning models onto the DeFi markets in general and, and leverage the benefit of a lot of the algorithms that the traditional finance have come to use on a day to day basis into the, into the DeFi markets. So that's one use case. The second one is the retail investors themselves, right? Like, so, what choices people have on the retail side? People go to Yearn Finance, Beefy Finance, or a lot of these other uh, yield aggregators, as we call them, right? And they, they have something called static vaults, right? And its vaults have become like a de facto thing across the entire DeFi market, and we call them strategies in general. The challenge with current vaults is that they are very static. So you, you invest in a specific thing, you borrow against it, and you go somewhere else, and there's an APY. When that's asset stops working or that strategy stops working, that vault stops making money. And people take out their money, put it back in, the, uh, in their wallets, and then put it into next strategy. So if you go to Yearn or any of these finance, uh, uh, any of these protocols, you realize that a lot of the vaults are not really full, primarily because that strategy has stopped working. The challenge is, it is not adjusting to current market conditions. And market conditions are constantly changing. Uh, so they, what sommelier finance allows us to do is to actually have machine learning models that look at current market conditions and adjust to it based on what they are seeing in the market and what the data has shown in the past. So back testing information, just what traditional finance does in NASDAQ or any of these large organizations in general. right? And then finally, the community itself. right? So. The whole reason why we are even doing DeFi in the first place is we have banks, we have like centralized exchanges, but the whole reason is we want to democratize the whole uh, financial system in general. It's not just lending and borrowing, it's lending and borrowing, but also taking into consideration the users, the, what they want, how, what are the rates. They, they have a say in what the future of finance is, and that's why we wanted to kind of create this DeFi ecosystem. And hence, it's a really critical piece for, uh, for sommelier to focus on that piece as well. Uh, how do we do that? We actually have governance model that allows you to uh, participate in, uh, I don't think the mic is actually working, it's a prop, <laughs> sorry. I'm going to try to be louder. Maybe that will help. Good call. Um, 
So how we are doing it is allowing people to actually participate in the governance model itself. You can vote on which sellers or which strategies can go online and you can vote down. Also the validators themselves, which is an important part, right? Like so we, a lot of us actually know us from the Cosmos background, obviously we, uh, Cosmos is very big on the, uh, on the staking uh, and, and bringing the validator nodes as a critical piece of the ecosystem because it allows a second layer of safety mechanism in the process in sommelier finance, the validators have an important role. They actually can turn on or turn off a specific data feed from a machine learning model saying this is, no lo uh, this is compromised or this is no longer beneficial for the community. They can turn off and they can switch to a different model based on the same strategy. And we're gonna, we, I'm, I'm throwing a lot of new concepts and we're gonna look at a architecture and it's gonna be more clear once we look at the architecture in the, in the process. So overall, when we look at all of these components, it ultimately helps the overall uh, DeFi ecosystem in general. Let's take an example, right? Like, so we're very familiar with a couple of these protocols, Yearn Finance and Beefy Finance, right? And they are very, they have like hundreds of volts uh, across, across each of these uh, ecosystems. And Tesseract, uh, earlier today, they were just like porting a lot of these volts into new chains. It's all great, but again, they are static. Static means the strategy either works or it doesn't work. And when the strategy stops working, you put it back onto your wallet. Find the strategy that again works. Instead, what we are proposing is a dynamic vault. A uh, dynamic vault that is powered by off-chain computation. And this is really powerful. Let's, let's look at a, a few, few examples to kind of demonstrate what this means. A simple, anyone who has traded on, uh, on DeFi knows a couple things, right? Like one thing is Bitcoin goes up, Ethereum follows, then all the shit coin goes up, right? And then, and then rinse, repeat, everything crashes. One fine morning, you wake up on a Sunday morning, 40% up on across the board. And I was like, okay, that's fun. This is like time to dump. And then immediately get back into Bitcoin, Ethereum, shit coin, right? Like it just repeats that same cycle. A simple strategy like that can be automated using what we call Bitcoin to Ethereum ratio, right? Like there's a ratio gang uh, that does exactly tracking of that. 0 0.07, you know it, you're high on the Ethereum valuation, you go back to 0 0.03, something like that can be automated and that is a trading bot that would do something like that, right? You can't do that with Yearn. Yearn cannot track current market condition, look at what the, the ratios are in general and then be able to switch that position into stable coins wait for the ratio to get favorable again, and then reinvest uh, into, into these products, right? Like, so that is very commonplace in traditional finance. We, everybody does that, look at the valuation, PE ratios, switch things back, get into the positions again. Those things are possible on DeFi markets using the architecture that we are proposing. Second, a Twitter feed, right? Like, Twitter has been a staple in traditional finance to measure what is consumer sentiment. Right, like consumer sentiment are especially valuable for, for protocols like, uh, or, or things like NFTs. NFTs are very much, the, you can see the project getting really successful or, uh, on one of these NFT projects on, on Twitter and you can see the number of followers, number of action on those things, and they do well. Uh, so if you wanted to incorporate this off-chain data into a machine learning model, which is an open, open C or any of these DeFi protocols on, on, uh, or like decentralized protocols, and you wanna manage this computation, generate a model that takes into consideration the, uh, the Twitter feed or Twitter sentiment, you can do that with DeFi, uh, the uh, Somali architecture. And we're gonna look into that architecture a little bit more as we go through the session itself, right? So, and finally, uh, the Aave stablecoin lending position and uh, Simply put, and we're gonna go into, uh, Sun is gonna cover a little more detail of that first strategy itself. Simply put, it is the best way to invest into Aave if you're lending single position uh, stable coin. So instead of going to Aave directly, you should definitely come to Sommelier and we'll, we'll have the negligibly more uh, uh, risk to it and then we automate uh, the, the actual use case around it. And we'll go through it a little bit more. All right, so let's see how this all works. A very high level architecture, right? Uh, so Sun over here covers what we call the SOM quant team. And there is partner quant teams where we are working with a lot of our partners on hedge fund side or financial companies. They have machine learning models. They have 
battle tested uh, risk managed strategies that they want to be able they have used it on centralized finances or centralized exchanges or or nasdaqs or or, or dow jones of the world in general right they want to use the same strategy they come to some chain some chain has validated nodes in the in the process they agree the validated nodes agree that this chain uh, this data feed that we're getting from the machine learning model is trusted and it is one that we agree that it is beneficial to the community push it to what we call sellers and those sellers are cross chain right like so with one architecture this single provider which is the financial customer or a quant team can access any of the cross chain uh, strategies in general right like so this is genuine innovation allowing people to have off chain computation like machine learning models into controlling um, cross chain infrastructure or def, uh, the, the the strategies in general we're definitely target uh, we, we are going to be live on ethereum and then the next next one is avalanche and obviously the architecture is scalable to go other uh, other chains in general as well from users perspective it doesn't matter all this stuff is like completely hidden we're going to look at a sneak preview hopefully a little less blur than what we can see on the uh, at the end of the session itself and we're going to be live uh, with a very simple interface and it's the the vision of that interface is to be able to create a single place for coming uh, for people to come in and park their money across defi markets right like it's one place for defi liquidity management and that's really exciting and and allowing people to to start leveraging the power of machine for individual investment and that's uh, that's something that we're introducing all right so with new architecture comes new roles and i'm going to quickly dive a little bit about the roles themselves and then the actual strategy that we're talking about so you can't read it over here but it's a strategy provider the strategy providers uh, are are like quant teams funds who have machine learning background or have a strategy where say bitcoin ethereum at this ratio it makes profitable uh, decision for us to be in that position or not right like so that's a strategy provider but the, it, then there is a seller creator seller creator takes this idea from sun and team and and actually creates the infrastructure across chain so that they can access the market that exists right like we provide a lot of the protocol infrastructure but somebody needs to write this strategy in so that's the seller seller creator usually on ethereum it's a solidity dev and 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 on other chains it could be dif different things right finally the validators and and stakers they are sort of very critical to any of the cosmos chain in general and what they do stakers stake their stake and and secure the chain in, in our model, on the fee model that we have, we get additional benefit or the profit sharing on any of the strategies that are live, right? So you, the platform charges a platform fee. 1% AUM, like total assets under management, the platform charges 1% as a service provider. And then that money, 90% of it, is given back to the people who are securing the chain, using the staker to the validator kind of environment, right? And the validators have an important role. Not only they profit share uh, through, the, through the sellers themselves and staking, but they also have an important role of actually shutting down a specific data feed if they don't trust it, right? So if they're working with Sun and we are working on a specific stable coin and it's, it's a great strategy. Someone comes in and says, I using the same data, I can produce better results for the community. The validators can point their uh, data feed to a new data provider because on the previous slide we saw like there are multiple different quant teams so machine learning can be replaced and upgraded and the rest of the architecture remains abstracted and the user just gets the benefit of the newer uh, newer strategy that comes in yeah, or if I try to run yeah exact same thing yeah so and finally the governance itself right like the governance is also an important part and that's essentially why uh, we created DeFi in the first place, like having users have a say in it. They can vote to get a strategy live, and they can also vote to get the strategy out, or, or uh, vote on how much liquidity mining should be done on a single strategy or not. So there are multiple reasons why governance exists, and it's a critical piece of our uh, ecosystem as well. With that, I'm going to pass it on to Sun, and Sun's going to talk about a little bit under the covers, how do we get from strategy to one of the first strategies live on, uh, on the Somalia architecture itself. Thank you, Sam. 
So, okay, before we move on, uh, there was a lot of information and the Somali architecture is fairly complex. So I wanna just leave you with a couple of takeaways going forward. Okay, one of them is that what Somalia is essentially doing is decoupling the decision-making, financial decision-making from the execution, right? So what Sam is saying basically is that you can leverage arbitrary off-chain computation, be that some machine learning model, you can just be sitting there, you know, playing video games and decide what, what, strategies, what strategy you're using, literally anything off-chain, and you can take that and actually execute it on-chain in a decentralized way. And the goal of this workshop, actually, what we want from you, all of you, is to potentially actually come up with strategies and run them on Somalia. And so what I'm gonna show you is just how easy it is to do that with this architecture. And how, how much easier it is to do this with SOM than it is to do with something like Yearn. And so just to emphasize one more point, what we, what we mean by static is that in the Yearn-like architecture, all the logic has to be implemented in a smart contract, right? It's like you can't be dynamic because the contract is fixed, and that does provide a security feature for users, but it also limits flexibility, right? So what's the alternative? You know, multi-sig, sure, that's better than sending your funds to a single wallet, but that's clearly not what, where DeFi needs to go, right? So again, Somalia allows arbitrary off-chain computation to make decisions on-chain, and those decisions are secured by a validator set. So it's kind of the next evolution in this progression from single wallet to, to multi-sig into now we have these dynamic financial products. So let's talk about how you actually come up with a strategy, right? And um, trust me, anyone can do this. The bar is so low and we're live right now. We're gonna develop like a light version of our first seller, which is an Aave stablecoin seller. So here's the, here's the general, I don't know if you can see that, the general steps that we're gonna talk about. Uh, number one is getting data off the blockchain, right? Zaki always says, like, everyone thought about how to, really hard about how to put data on the chain, but not as many people thought about how to get it off. And we're going to talk about how you do that using a decentralized protocol called the graph, which is, like, the de facto way of getting data off the chain, at least right now. Next, we'll talk about actually cleaning that data and making it usable for us. We'll talk about coming up with a strategy. What we, we're using the word strategy a lot. We'll see what that actually means, and it's, it's very simple. And finally, we'll run a, a basic backtest. And I want you to manage your expectations, because the code is not sophisticated. It's not clean, but it'll, it'll at least demonstrate the point. And uh, let me know if you can't hear me, because I'm going to I'm gonna be sitting here you know, going through uh, this code base. Also, uh, feel free to ask questions, because I think it's important that you understand this stuff. Like, don't wait till the end. Stop me if something isn't clear or something doesn't make sense, and we can talk about it. And I, I would encourage you throughout this process to look for ways that this code is unrealistic and ways that it can be proved in a production setting. Okay. So, so let's start with the, actually, sorry. First, let me just do a quick uh, intro to what Ave is for those of you who don't, who aren't aware of it. Aave is a lending protocol. It's a decentralized lending protocol. It's the biggest protocol, uh, biggest lending platform right now. And basically what it lets you do is you can lend and borrow and the mechanism by which your interest rates are determined is all automated. It's all on chain, right? So you, you, know, you, have, you can see here if you wanted to borrow Binance USD, you have, you have, a, ver you have a borrow rate of 2.7% and those who are lending uh, BUSD earn 1.3 percent, right? And so this, this strategy we're going to develop is going to be a stable coin lending strategy. We're going to stick to the big three stable coins, which are DAI, uh, USDC, and Tether, USDT, okay? So let's just look at the interest rates right now live. So Tether is 1.86 percent, USDC is 0.9 percent, and DAI is 2.10%. So it's pretty clear that we would want to invest in DAI right now, right? And clearly USDC is the wrong choice, right? So if you're going to park your stables, it makes sense to earn the highest yield on that. The seller we're going to develop right now, or the strategy is just automating that process, right? Now one strategy you could use is just look at, you know, look at the current numbers and pick, but if we actually go into DAI, okay, this is, this spike messes the scale up a little bit, but you can see that the numbers actually vary a lot, right? So you, it, it oscillates between one and two, right? And so maybe picking, you know, if we look at the other curves, maybe picking the one with the current highest number isn't the right move. So we'll just talk about how to do this. Okay, that's one thing. 
Now let's talk about the graph a little bit, okay? So the graph is a protocol for indexing the blockchain. What that means is the blockchain in its native state is very, it's very hard to actually process data from that, right? You essentially have a series of blocks, which is a bunch of transactions. How do you make sense of that, right? It's, not, it's a non-trivial task. If you wanted to extract very specific information, look for certain transactions, right? Track state over time, it's a complex process. What the graph does is it's a protocol for automating this and in a decentralized way, right? And so, the way, I mean, the way to think about it is there's this API. It uses a GraphQL language, so you interact it with a language called GraphQL. And you can basically, you know, different protocols write subgraphs, which is their API, which lets you query certain information. So what we're looking at here is the Aave subgraph, right? So you can see there's all kinds of information on this. You want to look at deposit events, it gives you deposit events here. You want to look at like information on swaps, there you go. So this Aave subgraph is what we're going to start with. And let's look at some code. All right, I don't know um, how clear this is, but let's see. OK. So who, just quick, quick who, who knows a bit of Python? You just need a little bit of Python knowledge. Anyone? OK, that's good. Zaki, go easy on me. I know you, you hate Python. <laughs> but it's great. I think it, Python's great for at least demonstrating. OK. So here's a class. It's a, it's a, this is a class definition in Python, which is, is essentially connecting to the uh, graph, uh, this graph API that I, that I just showed you. Right? So let's just take a look at this. So first, we have this URL, which is just copied in. It's exactly this URL. right? We have the Aave lending pool address hard-coded in here, because we're going to need that information. Here's a function that takes a query. So that query is going to be in the format that the graph expects and submits that query and gets the response. Okay, that's all this get graph data function does. We have get query, okay? Now this function actually creates the query, okay? And what kind of query are we talking about here? Well, we want to get information on interest rates from DAI, right? That graph I showed you earlier, that graph is overloaded now. That plot I showed you with the interest rates vary uh, varying, we want to actually get that data into our code, right? So what we need for that is just a token address, right? So this token address would be the DAI token address. And let's break down what this query actually is saying. So first, you can see the term reserve here. That corresponds to reserve here, right? So in this, in this Aave schema, the subgraph is saying we have this data for reserves. Now, each reserve corresponds, it's, a, it's like a lending market, right? Each reserve corresponds to a token. And you can see the kind of information we have. We see the pool. This is the name of the token. The symbol is DAI, right? Decimals, this is like the lowest denomination of the ERC-20 token. And uh, the thing we care about is actually called liquidity rate. This is that interest rate, OK? And we'll see what it looks like when we read that. So here's, a, here's this, that's this format, right? It's saying we want the reserve with ID corresponding to DAI, or sorry, ID corresponding to the address of DAI. Uh, and this is all the data we want to get, right? We want to get what the symbol is. We want to get uh, liquidity rate, which is the, the interest rates, right? So GraphQL is a very intuitive language. I'm not going like, to get into too much detail on this. But it's, it's pretty straightforward to use, and I would recommend checking it out. But this is the way you get data off the blockchain, right? So what, what more do we need to do? Essentially, we need more than DAI. We're going to iterate through DAI, USDC, USDT, and get all that data. And that's what this code is doing. And by the way, real quick, the code is available publicly at, at this GitHub. Uh, it's block split 2022 20, and Sinbad. This is my GitHub. Uh, it's Sinbad with numbers instead of letters, wherever they can be. So uh, we'll, we'll try to put this link somewhere where you can access it, but all this code is available. OK, so let's run the code and see what we get. Sorry, let's run it from the top and see what we get here. All right, so we got some data. It says fetching data from this address. This is the die address. Let's see what it looks like. Right? So we have graph data. All right, and it's a bunch of random numbers. Right? This is essentially a list of all that data that we asked for. These numbers look huge, so clearly there's some cleaning that needs to be done. Right? But liquidity rate is the thing we wanted, which is interest rate. And now we essentially have a time series of these interest rates. So the, the natural next step is that we need to clean it, clean the data into a format that we can use, because those numbers are not human readable or human friendly. OK. 
So let's go to the next example. Again, I'm just going to run it from the top and then talk through it. OK, so this is a very simple script that takes, those, takes that data and cleans it, puts it into a data frame, pandas data frame, if you know what that is. The, a data frame is just an object that makes it easier to interact with the data. It lets you do things like query certain columns, right, query certain rows. And what this, so you, if you remember that previous number was huge, right? It looked like it hadn't been adjusted. So that's because Ave represents numbers by using their lowest denomination, and they add another factor on top of that, right? So each token, like DAI, has 18 decimals. 10 to the negative 18 is the smallest denomination. DAI, uh, Ave adds another factor of 10 to the 27, okay? So without getting too much into it, this code takes that raw data, okay, and cleans it and packs it up into a data frame. So let's see what this data frame looks like. And you'll see it's in a much more readable format. All right, and here we go. We have our borrow rate. This is a, this is a time series, so you have at each time step, right, it's, it looks like it's every couple minutes. We have a borrow rate variable. We have a borrow rate stable. And uh, our supply rate is the interest rate. So you can see right here how it's varying over time, OK? So OK, what do we have now? Now we have data. Now we can make decisions with that data, right? So that, it's that easy to get the data. This script, you can adapt it to, to get data from other protocols beyond Aave. I do recommend doing research into the mechanisms of each protocol so you can actually interpret what the columns mean and how to interpret those. But um, yeah, the script, the script works. OK. So finally, I showed you die data. This is just a function for getting data from all three stable coins that we care about. It's just looping through them and getting the data for each of them. Okay. Now let's get into the strategy okay, and what I mean by strategy. And again, manage your expectations because this is a light version. So first I'll run the code once again. Okay. Now let me just define what I mean by strategy. When we say strategy, what we mean is a mapping from data onto a financial decision, right? So one strategy is like, okay, I can pick, I'll pick the stable coin that, I'll, I'll randomly pick an alphabet from the alphabet and pick the stable coin that has a name closest to it, right? That's an example of a strategy. Another strategy is I'm going to look at Aave's UI and pick the one that has the highest APY, that's another strategy. What we're going to implement is a basic strategy that says, don't just look at the current time, but take like an average over the last couple hours, couple days, whatever. So that's a, that is a strategy. It's a very basic one, but I think it demonstrates a point. So let's go through this code. Uh, this is just a, you know, this is a basic function for taking that data frame that you saw, that time series, selecting the start and end of it, and um, it's just extracting those, those timestamps so we know what you know, what the time span is. Now we need to, you know, okay, so let me talk a little bit about what this strategy is going to do. So every, let's say every two days, right, you have this strategy that runs and you query the strategy and say, what's the best stable coin that I want to lend right now, right? You wouldn't want to do that every second because that's, first of all, uh, computationally inefficient and you're probably not going to get the, you know, it'll be high variance, right? So let's say you did this every two days. What this means is that essentially every two days you need to get the last two days of data, feed it to the strategy, and have it make a decision. Does that make sense? So that's what this slice data is doing. What I showed you before was a huge data frame of all the data. This is just going to cut that up into chunks that the strategy is operating at each interval on. Right? So I'm going to talk about periods. Those are periods between strategy updates. Right? So yesterday, the strategy said do, uh, invest in DAI or lend DAI. Tomorrow, the strategy might say lend in USDC, but it doesn't decide between. OK. Get strategy decision is that function that I just described that takes the mean of the, of the last few data, right? So you know, we, we say best token is none. It's going to iterate through each token, compute a mean, and pick the best one. OK? That's simple. That's literally all we mean by strategy. You have some data. You write a function that makes decisions. That's the, like, that's the bar to developing a strategy on SOM. And I'll, I'll get into why that's the case later. OK. So let's actually see um, what happened here. OK. So you can, we can see that we sliced our data, and we had our strategy make decisions over time. And you can see it says, OK, DAI is optimal for a couple periods. Then it's optimal to switch into USDT for a while and switch back into the DAI. 
in, into that. Now, this is consistent with what we saw with USDC having horrible interest rates right now, right? So at least the strategy didn't advise us to go into USDC. Um, so this is literally it. This is what a strategy is, right? It's something that takes data and makes decisions, and it's printing the token name. That's good enough. So let's, let's get into a back test. And this is the final piece of code, I promise. OK. So a back test basically takes a strategy and evaluates its performance historically. Right? There's a couple of reasons you might want to do this. One is to have a, some kind of estimate for whether this works. Another is selecting parameters. So I'd encourage you to think about like this, even this very basic strategy that I just told you, there actually is implicitly a parameter in there. So I'd encourage you to think about what that parameter is and how we can choose it. And I'll, I'll, you know, I'll spoil it at the end of, of this uh, code block. OK, so again, let's run the code. And again, what I mean by optimized parameters is you have different, you know, your strategy might have parameters on, that govern its behavior. And how do you select the best one, right? You have to see performance. And how do, you, how do you evaluate performance without actually deploying the thing and risking real money? Is you test it using historical data. And that's, that's what a back test is, right? OK. Um, so we're fetching a lot more data right now. This is actually, we're fetching a month's worth of data. So we're actually going to run a back test on this basic strategy for the last month. And um, we'll see how it performs. OK. So let's look at the results. Our strategy got gained $129 in interest, right? On, um, what is that? That's 100K in uh, principle. And you'll notice that it, it actually beats all the other holding strategies, right? So if you just picked DAI a month ago and, lent, and you uh, were lending DAI, the strategy would beat it, right? If you're doing USDC, the strategy would beat it, and same with USDT. In our back test, at least. That's the caveat. So I'll stop there for a sec, and I'll just highlight a few imp important things about what I just showed you. First of all, this is horribly unrealistic, OK? Like, you might be thinking, wow, is it that easy? The answer is no, because this strategy is not accounted for several extremely important aspects of the real world, OK? One is that there are gas fees. I think all of you know that doing anything on Ethereum is extremely expensive, right? So on a small amount of capital, it doesn't actually make sense to frequently rebalance back and forth. That's another benefit of vaults and sellers, which is that they batch transactions to make uh, gas more efficient, distributing costs among users. OK, that's one thing that's unrealistic. Another thing is that historically, you know, we can run this thing, historic, uh, historical simulation, say this is what would have happened. But we aren't accounting for the effect of our position on interest rates, right? Because you know that once we lend DAI, it shifts the market. And so interest rates are going to go down, right? So it's like, OK, maybe. USDT looks more favorable, but if I put a million dollars in, it's not going to be favorable anymore. So that's another thing that's been neglected. And there's a couple other things that I'll leave as an exercise to think about, but this is basically the lightest and minimal MVP version of what a strategy is, and there's infinite complexity that can be handled off-chain. So, you know, this is, I hope this at least demonstrates that it's very easy to develop a strategy. You can do it in a few lines of code. You can go to this repo, copy the code, and add sophistication as you want. Now, let me just finally wrap up by explaining why this is the case, that it's so simple to develop a strategy on SOM. It's because, like I prefaced with, when we separate the decision making from the execution side, it opens up the door to people with backgrounds not in smart contract development, right? Like, how, how, how can you expect someone with like a quant, you know, trading background to suddenly become a smart contract developer to build a urine vault, right? You can't. And so what we can provide to prospective strategy providers is we do have smart contract developers, right? And so we can handle building out the execution arm of it. And, and help onboard new potential strategy providers. Alternatively, if you know, any, anyone who has their own smart contract developers is free to build their own sellers. And so this really is an ecosystem where hopefully people with all kinds of different backgrounds can intellectually contribute. So I'll stop there. Let's, uh, where's the, is that it? OK. Yeah. And let's, let's, let me finally say that this was, a toy. this was a toy strategy that I just showed you. But it's actually the light version of our first product, right? So our first strategy is literally doing what we just did, which is optimizing over stable coins on Aave. How it's doing it is, of course, more sophisticated. We're not just you know, taking a, an average over the last 
uh, period, and we do actually account for position size and for, um, you know, for gas costs. But basically, you know, that's what it is, right? We're ingesting data, we're cleaning the data, and we make a decision with the strategy. And so that's launching, uh, you know, within a couple of weeks is the plan. And I, you know, it's, it'll, be, it'll be interesting. It definitely looks much clearer in real life than on the screen. <laughs> yeah. This that. was supposed to be like a, you know, like a banger moment yeah. with the UI, but it's, well, it's kind of falling flat. But yeah. as a user, it is, it is definitely abstracting all of that complexity. You just come in, you attach your wallet, uh, depending on which chain you're working on, you attach your wallet, you deposit the money, uh, you deposit the money into the actual seller, and the seller does the job for you. Automatically rebalances, automatic accounts for the, uh, the gas fee, and all that fun stuff, right? Like, so you get the power of machine learning as a retail user, and you can start leveraging uh, the future of DeFi ecosystem. So that's our presentation. Would love to ask some questions. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. Okay. Was this interesting? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so those strategies, it's something that like, you do. Um, but you also mentioned that you can have um, like the blockchain strategy, the cooperation with this app and so on. It's something that um, a third party could, could provide to use the, like, the system. I mean, I was yeah. Like my own strategy. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so all of the roles that we saw early on are, are something that, uh, right here, all of the roles you can participate in, uh, as either of these roles, right? Like we have started, like Sun is, uh, Sun and his team are the first strategy provider on our platform. But that is something that we are discussing with other hedge funds and other financial customers. They are like, yeah, we have quantum. We don't really need Sun per se, right? Like, so our own team. Uh, and hence, that is the democratization of that piece as well, right? Like, so people can provide, uh, people can provide their own strategies, or be the, just the strategy provider, or people can be solidity devs, and they're like, we don't know anything about financial uh, mumbo jumbo. Like, we just care about building solidity sellers, and that's okay too. So you can participate. Uh, you can participate in the in the ecosystem by uh, either of these roles, and they're all open for anyone. Yeah, and let me just clarify. Oh, sorry. Incentives and like seed funding available through the protocol. So to be clear, if you have a strategy or you're interested in coming up with a strategy, please reach out to us, and you can run a strategy on Somalia. The the point is for it to be this decentralized ecosystem with diverse market participants, right? And so anyone with a strategy can build one with or without smart contract experience, right? All that's required is what I just showed you, and that's you know even arguably some of that isn't required. Please. What's the incentive for the strategy providers and sellers to create the Great question? Why so do they do that? Yeah, yeah, because uh, so according to our fee model, as a strategy provider, we have a very traditional, uh, like a fee model where you can charge the performance fee. So if you think you have a cool strategy and a good alpha that you can benefit 10% or 15% on the commission or the, the actual performance fee, you can charge that and now you have all the retail liquidity coming into your protocol or institutional either, either of those things and you get a 15% cut out of your strategy working well, right? So you move away from you degening or aping into one thing to like a more a sustainable revenue stream that's coming for you. As a platform, we get 1% AUM and it ultimately goes back to the stakers, 90% of it actually goes to the stakers. So that also promotes the ecosystem. Yeah, so like Sam mentioned earlier that, um, you know, governance actually gates the approval of new sellers and strategies. And part of that governance process is deciding on this, um, this like kind of fee distribution, right? So like any fund manager or something, you decide the rates. Just you have to keep in mind in the proposal that governance will only approve a strategy if it's beneficial to stakers, right? So you get a percentage, but the platform and stakers have to get a percentage. And I will say one thing that's interesting, which I want to plug, which is an amazing idea in my opinion, um, is that some, Somalia is really a new kind of uh, mechanism for, you know, for, for incentivizing stakers, right? Like you see a lot of inflationary mechanisms where 
protocols just print money and distribute it to stakers. What Somalia is trying to do is very different, which is a more sustainable way of incentivizing stakers by taking actual revenue earned from value created by SOM and distributing that to stakers, right? So as more strategies are run on SOM, that's more fees that are going to the platform, which is more incentive for stakers. And you can see that this is clearly, a, a, you know, well, the, the plan is that it's a more sustainable mechanism. So I hope that answers. Please. This, this, uh, you're asking about the Aave strategy? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the beauty of dealing with stable coins is that we don't have to deal with things like, you know, we don't have to worry, it's, it's, de it's trivially delta neutral, right? You could argue that if, you know, we were lending UST, that's not actually the case. <laughs> but um, right now, uh, Zaki kind of mentioned this in his panel, we're, this very first strategy, we, we chose it by design to not deal with things like market volatility. But, you know, we could get into it. Like Yeah, we need to we need to go beyond uh, stablecoin lending strategies to for the platform to be sustainable. But it's a great first, you know, almost uh, demonstration. Okay, and uh, those uh, strategies they are include the drop shipping. So correct me if I'm wrong, but how do you prevent strategy provider if he becomes big enough to become the actor? Uh, yeah, so yeah, it's a great the question. question. Yeah, so. This is, that's exactly the crux of like what the architecture is designed to do, right? That's the key, right? Urine works really well because users trust it because you can see all the computation. The question is, what hap how do you know, what, how do you deal with a bad acting strategy provider? So Sam mentioned this earlier, but to, to you know, emphasize that, Somalia has a validator set that actually gates con strategy provider control of a seller, right? So a seller is a smart contract that's executing actions Strategy providers are doing stuff on chain and sending instructions to that smart contract, but those instructions are gated by the validator set, right? So there's two levels of security. One is that if a strategy provider starts misbehaving, validators can cut off control, and that's it, right? There's no, uh, you know, they can, they can react quickly and cut off control. Notice how that's better than governance, right? Governance is like a multi-day process. Validators can react much more quickly. Yes, yeah, so, that, so, so here's the second layer. There are two layers. That was the first layer. The second layer is that the smart contract actually limits the space of actions that a strategy provider can take, right? So if you look at our Aave seller, which the contract is going to be open source, you can see that the only actions that a strategy provider can recommend are lending different stable coins, right? So what's the worst thing? They can't send funds to an arbitrary address, right? They can't buy some particular shitcoin. The worst thing they can do is lend a bad stablecoin. And then, he can yeah. change ratio if he has enough funds and then, then gain the, on the other side of the Maybe so. <laughs> yeah, insider trading is, uh, is possible. There. But that's fair. That's, that's just a tough problem, right? And uh, like the user, they provide their stake, their money. And is it like locked in the strategy? In the meaning like, so, so I think that's a great question. Uh, it depends on the strategy provider itself, right? Like, so, so in this specific strategy, the Aave stablecoin strategy, you can, it is not locked. So you can take out money whenever you want. But uh, in the future, there might be some strategies where people, it is only profitable if you hold the position for three months or six months. That happens in traditional finance all the time. There's an open window and then there's like a lockup period and then you take out the money, hedge funds do that. It is dependent on the strategy, but it will be visible for the users when they come in to see what, uh, what the conditions are. And the second part, which is hidden behind the, uh, the covers in general, the money is actually locked in the, the actual L1 that you want, right? Like, so we don't, we're a non-custodial uh, protocol, which means we're just directing and managing your assets, uh, or the strategy is, but in reality, your money is going through Aave into Ethereum, right? Like, so if you trust Ethereum, that's where your money's gonna be. So if one day, SOM goes out of business, hopefully not, but like if it goes out of business, it doesn't exist for whatever reason, you can go down to the Ethereum and get your funds, user funds back, right? Like, so there's another layer of security in the, in the architecture itself. Uh, one sec, we'll come back to it, please.
Zaki, you. I mean, so the way at least liquid staking works in the module that I designed is that you aren't getting rid of the unbonding period. You are just transferring the risk between users. So, it, like, we do want people to be able to stack some yield, um, like the yield of earned strategy execution with other forms of DeFi. Like, that'll be essential in the long run. Uh, but I don't think that that, like, those tokens will still be bonded to a validator and validator, the validators that will be still stable and still accountable for their uh, Yeah, I think that's fair. The, the fear of, again, in company of regime delegation, which are pretty instant now. Yeah. There's also a lot of issues because, um, again, there's no unbonding anymore. So just re-delegate, you don't go through unbonding at all. You just skip it. But you're still accountable for both on both sides. That's true. So I guess you can hedge. You had a question? Yeah, so I understood that the users, they can move their liquidity freely. And this made me curious, like, what is a better strategy for you as a sommelier? Is it uh, better for you to have people, users, who will be moving from strategy provider to another strategy provider, like jumping and seeking like the better yields? Or is it better for you if certain people are attached to a certain strategy and they are playing in the long run? What is yeah. better? So I think I'll answer that question with a little bit of a vision of what this would become in a year from now or a year and a half from now, right? What we come up with is uh, one of these strategies. Imagine we have a lot of these strategy providers building a lot of strategies. What we call, uh, what we have is strategy Legos, right? Like so people, some, some of them are stable coin lending positions. Some other ones are a little more alpha generating. In a year from now or a year and a half from now, we would have enough strategies on the platform that people can come in and answer a few questions, like a user would say, my risk tolerance is very high or very low, my retirement date is this date, like a betterment, uh, like experience, right? Like you come in, you click, 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 and your money gets deployed automatically across multiple strategies. Mm -hmm. So the seller architecture itself, you can use the strategy as part of a different strategy, right? So in the future, people can create uh, a customized strategy or a portfolio uh, for a user and you can introduce your money and that is tailored to you. And, and hence, you don't have to jump between the thing because you created this uh, thing and it has, it has personalized to your own investment as a style. Yeah, people are always going to choose the risk parameters that they're willing to tolerate. It's that simple, right? Like, yeah, and it depends. Yeah, and we're, all, we're working with, yeah, we're, we're talking with many other people and they admit that they're, they're, limi uh, they're limited to going to centralized exchanges, uh, primarily because they have machine learning models and risk managed uh, strategies. They just point it towards centralized exchanges because they can point there, but there is no direct access to DeFi and that's one of the main reasons to create a SOM which has, uh, let's say, familiarity in the architecture uh, to allow people to use machine learning models or models in general, and pointed towards DeFi market. So it's it's uh, it's an evolution from here to uh, to the uh, sommelier finance vaults. Yes. I didn't understand the exact question. So more than 51% of the we value. Don't run any value. Yeah, we, we don't run any, none of ours are, he has a very strict recommendation. None of the team members and none of the people that we know run validators at all. Like they, they're all like international, uh, very well trusted validators. All the big boys, like I think Figment, Chorus One, uh, Gateway, yeah, yeah. So they are, they are running, no, we, nope, yep.
Yeah. For right now, yes. For, for right now, that's uh, the case. No, I mean, uh, you can do that without your help. I don't use your help in a system that I just plug in with my machine and then it works. Yeah, so it's still early, right? Uh, we haven't even launched our first seller, but ultimately the plan is to become like where we, you know, we, you've been, you never have to see us again. But right now there's a lot of like, there's a lot of design still going on in the, in the seller architecture space. And you know, also if you need, if you, if you just need smart contract development support, right? Like not every, most strategy providers don't have smart contract teams, so we can provide that. So yes. what, and, and one of the things on the roadmap uh, is to create a seller UI, right? Like so seller creator UI. So as a user, you can come in and say, I'm a strategy provider, these are the parameters, and then we'll click, 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 and be able to do that. But it is a bit away from, uh, I mean, we're, we're a little bit away from that vision, uh, and obviously away from automated uh, liquidity management, personalized liquidity management vision. But that is the vision, and the architecture allows you to get there. Actually, okay, but in theory, yes, you can do it yourself, right? You just, you have to make a governance. You have to write the contract, make a proposal, governance has to approve it, right? And then validators have to select you as a strategy provider. In practice, it's easier if, if we help on board. But we're, we're happy to help, and we don't charge anything, so come, come work with us. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. yeah? Yes. Losing money or not earning at all, so nobody else earns yes, that's right. that's right. That's absolutely correct. In fact, uh, while we were designing the fees of one of these sellers, they are intentionally chosen to be a share of the seller itself, right? Like so, the, the even the fees, if the seller stops performing, by the it, it performs really well for the first week when we collected the fees, but it doesn't perform well for the last two weeks the fees automatically get reduced uh, as part of the share of the seller itself. So we have uh, designed it in a way that it takes into consideration if the system makes money, people make money, everybody makes money. If people don't make money, there is no, uh, there's, there's no multiple money. checks uh, of the yeah. I think it's kind of a management fee, right? It's like this is what typically like, people pay for institutions do as well. It's like regardless of profit, there's a just management fee based on that fee is still active, right? But um, the yeah, performance fee is gone. Yeah, the performance fee, of course, yeah. you know, if you don't perform, there's no performance fee. But this whole fee, fee distribution mechanism is actually, uh, it's flexible, right? Like the strategy provider and seller creator are the ones who should design, should design this. And the standard is, you know, management fee, performance fee, that's like a try and model. But you can make a governance proposal with the seller that does something completely random in fee distribution. It's just a question of whether governance thinks it the chicken and the egg problem. So basically you're seeking the strategy providers and then you have the supply of these strategies and then you can find users for that. Or are you thinking about the combination? Are you thinking about finding users and then coming with these numbers to the strategy providers and say, hello, we have this I think it was very aptly written, <laughs> it's spoken on the previous panel, which is liquidity mining at the beginning. Uh, and that's something that the initial strategy would be, uh, the community would approve to, to get liquidity mining on initial strategies, and then once we have some critical mass, we produce additional strategies. My entire role at the company is to go find other vendors, and that's essentially what we've been doing, and there's a lot of traction for that uh, additional strategy providers as well. So, so we're doing all of the above. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Cool. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>